Welcome to the stand of the Enthusiasts of British Motor Vehicles in Hall 3 of the National Exhibition Centre for the November 2024 Classic Car Show. On our stand we have Guy Hargreaves 1970 Mark 1 Ford Escort 1300 Super which has just finished the major refurbishment on. It is known as EV. Next is Tosh Brooks' 1987 1600 Ford Capri Laser, which, for reasons unknown, is missing a sunroof, which was thought to be standard fitting on these cars. The eldest car on the stand was Wendy Woodward's 1961 Mark II Ford Zephyr Lowline, a 205E, with its six-cylinder 2.5-litre engine. It is named Zephy the Zeph. Finally, the newest car on the stand was my Jaguar XJ6 Sovereign with its 4.2 litre engine. The car is called Earl. Adjacent to the Enthusiast stand is the MG SV Club. The MG Xpower SV is one of the rarest MGs with just 92 chassis being laid down. All but four were completed before the administrators of MG Rover Group stopped production and it is believed that these last four may have subsequently been finished. One with the roof removed to make it into a convertible. These cars are all fitted with Ford V8 engines from the Ford Mustang and were hand assembled in the MG Sports and Racing facilities at Longbridge. Prices started at £65,750 in 2004. Across the walkway, the MG Car Club was displaying a selection of MGs, the first belonging to Roger King, who was formerly the MP, whose constituency included the Longbridge Car Factory. It's a monogram MG TF. Also on the MG stand was a lovely MG CGT with its six-cylinder engine, and the Chinese MG Cyberster, an all-electric two-seater sports car. On the Rover Coupe Owners Club stand, there was a trio of these lovely R8 coupes. Yes, Rover used the R8 code before Audi. These cars look quite sexy for Rovers. I'm pleased you said that, Anthony, as I quite fancy one of those coupes myself. I particularly like the look of that blue one just beyond the grey here. Really nice looking car. The Rover 75 and MG ZT Owners Club displayed three early cars. The first is Josh Bridie's pre-production February 1999 V6 engine car, which is rebuilt to a very high standard. Next comes a Longbridge-built Rover 75 diesel dating back to April 2001. The Rover 75 first went on sale in June 1999 and in 2000 production shifted from the Cowley plant to Longbridge. Finally, the oldest known Rover 75 registered on the 18th of December 1998, a pre-production car which has quite a career. Once the Rover 75 was launched it was made available for filming and appearances included Silent Witness, New Tricks and Murphy's Law, dressed as a police car. Once returned to the factory it was used by company protection services to patrol the works. It was rescued in a sorry state from the administrators and returned to as-built condition by the Rover 75 and MG ZT Owners Club. This delightful mini jet black was rebuilt into a new body shell by Claire under the guidance of her father. She was 12 years old when she started the project. It is perfect better than it was when it originally left Longbridge. Claire went on to apply for an apprenticeship at Jaguar and showing the results of her endeavours on this Mini certainly helped her gain her apprenticeship place. This Austin 16.6 is a Passen Joyce Coupe and one of only three made. This is the only one known to remain. It left the Longbridge factory as a chassis and was delivered to Passen Joyce, one of London's Austin dealers, where the Wayman body was installed. Having been rebuilt in the first years of this century, 
It was one of the cars in the cavalcade that travelled from Birmingham city centre to Cofton Park outside the Longbridge factory gates in July 2005 to celebrate the centenary of the founding of the Austin Motor Company. It now lives in London. The car dates back to 1930. When your classic car cover is coming up for renewal, try our club scheme arranged with Peter James Insurance. It offers great rates and a range of exclusive benefits including free salvage retention and multi-vehicle options. Just click the link in the description below to get a quote. This is a 1972 Ad Nova. It is the third prototype and after its third rebuild it looks perfect. It is the oldest known survivor. Its owner, Ad, first saw the car when he was 14 years old in 1977. The Rover 200 and 400 Owners Club displayed the Rover R8 derivatives that we've not yet seen. The Tora was planned as a low volume car and the rear quarter panels were made from standard four door panels modified to accommodate the load area. Remarkably we cannot see the joins. Inevitably the car sold really well and the planners wished that they had originally retooled to make a single pressing. The Cabriolet was a popular car even though it rains in some parts of the country regularly. The Rover 200 was quite an attractive design as the three door and the five door sold really well. The Rover 400 was the four door derivative which looks very professional with its boot. This next car brings back memories for me as I once owned a green Rover 216 GSI exactly like that one in the picture. Love that car, although it was a bit thirsty. It used considerably more fuel than the Citroen BX 1.9 TRS that it replaced. Still liked it though. The MG Car Club Young Members Branch had a display alongside the MG ZR, ZS and ZT register. The youngsters displayed an MGF, an MG ZS and an MG BGT. Also displayed were a very shiny blue MG ZT, an unusual green ZS and a silver ZR. The last three cars being the latest facelifted models from 2004 and 2005. The Maxi Owners Club were celebrating the car's 55th birthday with four cars of various ages. I could not believe that it was over half a century since the car's launch, as I can remember it. And here celebrating 50 years of the Range Rover. First this lovely white model, but hidden behind it, uh, dressed up in its police livery, is a 1994 Land Rover uh, Vogue SE90 uh, first registered in October 1994 and still with all the markings the lights still looking ready to go and head off down the country's motorways patrolling for scallywags Land Rovers here a series 2 were used by many forces across the world this one by the RAF they were also used as fire tenders for all sorts of specialist environments. Here is another unusual Series 2 chassis cab with a tipper back fitted to it. This is a lovely Austin 7, as the first Austin Minis were known. It was not long before the name on the boot changed to Austin Mini. This car was registered in July 1960, less than 12 months after the car's launch. There were real minis everywhere, this group being the Cooper Sport 500 and 2000 register. Excuse me, madam. 
and alongside we have the Mini 40 register. And now we venture over to the Mini Cooper register. 33 EJB is one of the most famous Minis in the world. It was driven by Paddy Hopkirk in 1964 to win the Monte Carlo Rally. There also appears to have been a Mini Traveller as a service barge as well. On the Moak Club stand here are three Mini Moaks. The first, the pale blue, is an all-electric affair we believe is built in France. Other more recent Moaks, of course, have been built in Australia. Uh, originally intended for the British Army, but uh, the Army rejected them on the grounds that the ground clearance was inadequate. Based on the real Mini, the Midas was a kit car, which was updated with later ones being based on the Metro and Rover 100. Morris built 350 minor millions to celebrate the building of the millionth Morris Minor. All were built in December 1960 and painted in lilac, with off-white hide seats. Just 30 were made in left-hand drive, and about 70 survive today. Here are four of them. I found this delightful Austin J40 pedal car on one stand. 32,000 were built by disabled Welsh coal miners in the Rimney Valley. This 12.6 Austin Harley on the Austin 10 Drivers Club stand belongs to Maurice Palmer, one of the training managers at the Austin at Longbridge during my apprenticeship. It is, like the other cars on the stand, in superb condition. Here is Graham Bryan's smart Austin 10 open road. It's a bit of a pity that the roof is up, even though we hope that the NEC roof does not leak. Behind is David Jameson's 1934 Austin 18, York, which would have cost about £328 when new. How prices have gone up. David is another former MP, as was Herbert Austin himself. I wonder how many former MPs have had a connection to Longbridge and its products. Alan Hitkiss was very lucky to find this superb 1936 Austin 20 Mayfair after his previous one was severely damaged in an accident. Well, that is being repaired some years later, this one was in better condition and always makes heads turn. This 1958 Austin A40 was campaigned by Pat Moss, Sterling's sister, and navigated by Anne Wisdom in the Monte Carlo Rally in 1958. This was the first practical classics project car introduced in issue one, volume one, in 1980. It was last sold in May 2021 by Bonhams for a mere 45,000 pounds. The Land Crab Club International has five cars on its stand. Firstly is a white Morris 1800S Mark II with its metal stripes down the side and Rostar wheels. Immaculately presented is Clive Serrell's pristine Austin 1800 Mark I. We saw how perfect his daughter Claire had made her jet black real mini earlier under the Clive's training. Both cars demonstrate how much of a perfectionist he is. There are another two Mark I Austin 1800s, both exceedingly well presented, and a Wolsey 1885 on their stand. It's one of my regrets that I've never been near one of these cars, never been in one, never even been close to one. Uh, they look beautiful and very comfortable and people talk so affectionately about them. Oh well, maybe someday, it's not too late. The pre-war Austin 7 Club had several cars on their stand and here we see a March 1932 saloon, whilst the grey chummy with its headlamps adjacent to the front scuttle was made in 1925, just over three years from the launch of the Austin 7. The third car, a two-seater Sports, dates back to 1931. 
On the Midland Austin 7 stand are a maroon Austin ruby, a blue open Tora from 1938, another ruby in black from October 1936, and a pearl from July 1938. The Vanden Plath Owners Club had three or four beautiful cars for display. Firstly, this Rover 200 Vanden Plath. Mind the tree, Richard! Then the Van der Plaat 1500, which of course was not to be referred to as an Allegro. It was never called the Allegro. Beautiful example there. And then finally, the uh, ADO 16 version of the Van der Plaat here in the corner. Beautiful example. It's a lovely little car. And this one, unlike the Van der Plaat 1500, which we won't call an Allegro, this one had the picnic tables in the back. As always, the Austin Counties Car Club put on an excellent display that we are looking at backwards. First is an Austin A40 Somerset that was used for a publicity stunt by Alan Hess who drove it with Ken Walton and Ron Jevons from the equator in East Africa to Jokmok on the Arctic Circle in 11 days, driving day and night. Next, we have David Wiley's lovely Jensen-bodied A40 Sport a replica of the car that Hess drove round the world in three weeks in another of his Austin-sponsored adventures. Finally, they have the oldest car of the three, an Austin 16, which was fitted with Austin's first overhead valve engine just after the Second World War. Also on the stand were a selection of these little Austins in saloon and countryman forms. The 1100 Club had this lovely Jensen conversion of an Austin 1100 Mark I saloon into a soft top. It looks lovely alongside the orange Mark III estate. The eldest car by far on the Riley stand is this 1905 9 horsepower car. Alongside is a November 1967 Riley Elf, a derivative of the real Mini, fitted with the 998 A series engine. How lovely to see a little July 1963 Hillman M alongside a 1952 Jaguar XK120. Ah, the old Sinclair C5. This is a small one-person battery electric recumbent tricycle. Technically an electrically assisted pedal cycle. It was the culmination of Sir Clive Sinclair's long-running interest in electric vehicles. Although widely described as an electric car, Sinclair described it as a vehicle, not a car. DPM Auto Body was showing off their skills with a lovely 2 plus 2 E-Type Jaguar and an Aston Martin DB6, although I'm not sure about the Aston's colour. Maybe Barbie has ordered one. The Volvo also looks good, if you are a fan of Volvo. How lovely is this miniature Austin Healing 3000? I suspect it is electrically driven by a youngster. It certainly looks to be very accurately built to one third scale. It is displayed with a Nash Healy prototype dating back to the 1950s and an MGA Coupe, one of its kind built. Here on the Vauxhall Viva Owners Club we kick off with a 1971 Vauxhall Firenze. Why didn't it compete better with the Capri? Probably the 1256cc engine let it down. Next up the blue is a customised HB Viva 1968. That's the fairly rare estate version. 
in the red car is another HB Viva. This one's the Saloon, a 1970, followed by a Viva GT. This was powered by a 1975cc overhead cam four-cylinder engine, rated at 104 brake horsepower. Lastly, the Droop Snoot version of the HC Viva, another HB in a rather lovely colour. That's another GT. Amazing to see two GTs on one stand. This orange MGTF 500 is one of the last 500 built in Cab 1 at Longbridge. I was expecting the Rolls-Royce Employees Motor Club to have a Rolls-Royce on display. But sadly it turns out that it's a 1910 Renault with a 2,402cc engine. I have had five Montego estates and my last one was identical to Tanya Fields Montgomery. They were fantastic cars and the diesels very economical. The MG6R4 was a fantastic rally car and I was involved in installing the facilities to make the body shells. Of the 200 built, it is believed there are about 600 left. However, some of the homemade ones have a 1275 A series engine just driving the front wheels. This is Monty, a fully restored one ton Land Rover 101, which started life in 1975 with the Royal Marines, carrying supplies and alive troops. Once sold into civilian life, it lived in Colchester before being bought by Morton's funeral hire. It underwent a complete rebuild in January 2002 as a hurt. Now, if you're a fan of SD1s as I am, uh, you'll notice the white one, which is approaching shortly, is uh, one of the very few surviving twin-turbo uh, V8 models made by Turbo Technics. Absolute beast of a thing, uh, with the two turbos and the carburetors mounted in front of the turbos in a draw-through system. Simple but very effective. Ah. I'm talking of forced air. <laughs> Find the next car. Yes, I wouldn't be a bit upset if you bought that. Nice, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Very nice. Oh, look at that. Just a gorgeous 1969 Vauxhall Victor. Love it. Filthy beast. Excuse me, madam. Just to interrupt the video for a moment, I want to introduce a feature here. It's called Julie's Basket. Uh, Gar, who is uh, the organizer of our club events and operating the camera at this point in the video, uh, is using his mum's mobility scooter, which has a, sh a shopping basket on the front. Her name's Julie, and so Julie's Basket. Look out for it in further scenes. Very smart Range Rover there. Love the poppy on the grill. Good for you guys. Now this is the club stand of the Gay Classic Car Group. They always do a good show. Uh, Range Rover on our left there, followed by a little Austin. A30, I think. Slightly distracted by the gent with the hat and the stick. Reminds me a bit of Alf Garnet. No offence. Very smart. As we get round the front, we'll see it is an, I think, that, yeah, it's an A30. Next to it, a Renault Twingo. That's an unexpected sight. And a rather lovely brown-coloured Lancia. And a bright blue Volvo. That is an unusual colour. And with the white walls too. Looks a bit different. It's very beautifully presented though, as you would expect from the Gay Classic Car Group. They always put on a good show. Behind the Volvo, a very nice Porsche Carrera. Beautiful car. Soft top. What a good one. Oh, there's Julie's basket again, making an appearance, sneaking down the side of the Porsche. The basket makes a sharp U-turn, and there's an MG Montego Turbo. I once worked at NatWest in Bristol, and all of the managers had MG Montego Turbos. There was a whole car park full of them. Quite a sight. They all loved them, too. I think that's the most MG Montegos I've ever seen in one place. No doubt true, Gar, but I'm telling you there were more in the NatWest manager's car park. 
I remember that uh, when the Montegos were changed, they had a change every two years, they were all given Vauxhall Vectras. Most of them wanted their Montegos back. Now Julie's basket continues on cruise control past a Montego uh, estate, looking good in the blue. Lovely uh, ADO 16 in police livery opposite. And a couple more Montegos on show here. Very good cars in their day, better than the Sierra and the Cavalier in my opinion. Controversial. If you've seen our BL Rally video from Milton Keynes, you'll have seen this white Montego estate before. The owner bought it with some 280,000 miles on the clock. Driving along, he was pulled over by the police, who asked if it was his car. The policeman went on to say that it had been one of their unmarked cars, and last time he drove it, the odometer showed over 800,000 miles. This means it's now completed over a million and a quarter miles. That's got to be the world's most recognisable engine. I'd know it anywhere. It's just iconic, that rocker box. Mind the tree, Richard. Oh, Julie's basket is back where she headed this time. Went straight down the aisle. Oh, taking a right over towards the Allegro. I do like an Allegro. That's the Mark I, the best of them, in my opinion. I like the orange too. Look at the condition of that. That's a Marina Coupe 1.8 TC, I believe. Much sought after, quick car. Looks like he's had an engine swap. Not sure what that is. Looking around to the Princess. I'm surprised Julie's basket went towards the Princesses, given Gar's history with the Princess. And an MGTF there on your left. Back over the other side, a Morris Marina. That one's a 1975. That registration number seems familiar. Anyhow, it's the coupe again in a rather fetching green. MVS421 is a gorgeous Rover P4. Really love that one. And the gold convertible there is a 1963 Rover 90. And last but not least, a very fetching pale blue Rover P4. I really like that. Sticking with the blue, this one's a 2-litre Ford Capri from 1983. Beautifully presented. And the red car beside it is a 1937 Jaguar SS100. Absolutely stunning. Just take a look at this beautiful pink Vauxhall Cresta, owned by group member Roy Gaskill, and a real credit to him. Nice one, Roy. And the little white hatchback on the corner here is a 1994 Peugeot 106 Rally. This is just having a 0 to 60 time of 10.7 seconds. I'm a sucker for a good colour, so I love this Porsche. It's a 2002 Boxster S. Listed with a 0 to 60 time of 5.9 seconds. And beside the Porsche is this red 1977 MG Midget. Next up, this white car's a model that's been catching my eye lately, a Lotus Esprit Turbo, 1986, with a 152 mile an hour top speed. Love it. This little beige coloured cutie is a 1968 Fiat. If anyone knows what model it is, Tell us in the comments. When your 2.5 24-valve V6 simply isn't enough in your mid-sized MG saloon, just bolt on a Sprintec supercharger as well. Yes, madam. And to finish up our look at the show, we're back at the Enthusiast of British Motor Vehicles stand. Anthony's lovely Jaguar, Ian's Ford Zephyr looking fantastic as always. Tosh brought the lovely Capri, probably the most popular car on our stand. And Guy brought this gorgeous restored Ford Escort, the Mark 1 1100cc. Probably one of the few Escorts at the show that didn't claim to be a Mexico or an RS. Good for you Guy, lovely motor. That's it from us. Thanks to all the owners for bringing their cars. It was a really good show. Thanks to you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already done so. Give us a like. It does help. And do join us next time.